What's up everyone? Today we're going to be going over the latest acquisition for Lunar Outlaws Garage. And before my main core of audience runs for the hills because it's another Japanese import, hang around, maybe I might be able to change your mind about this car. First off, you guys know I love muscle cars. Whether it's the 63 Cadillac Coupe DeVille we pulled out of the pole barn fairly close by, the 72 Satellite we pulled out of New Jersey, or the, uh, the 70 Buick Skylark we pulled out of Texas and drove all the way home. There's a reason why I love those cars, it's because the raw power, the looks of them, and quite honestly, the presence. Doesn't matter what kind of uh, situation they're in, they always look good. These cars are awesome because of multiple reasons, a lot of them in that, that category. Perhaps you want a muscle car that can still handle. Dual wishbone suspension in the front, full independent suspension in the rear that can handle quite a bit of power, and during the time that these things were manufactured, they were aimed to be able to take on some of the big dogs of the time. Some of the Porsches, the higher end Corvettes, it was, it was meant to be Japan's greatest, or at least Toyota's greatest pony car. You don't sacrifice any of the luxury, and you get Toyota reliability. Sort of. So let's go ahead, go over through this car, and... Uh, to me, it's one of the greatest pony cars that have ever come out of any industry. Kind of like the Ford Fox bodies. Not the biggest fan of the, the looks, but man, the performance of that car is undeniable. Or say you really love the third generation Camaros. Me too. I think they're freaking awesome. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. We'll do a buyer's guide on these because quite honestly, there are some things that you have to pay attention to or you'll end up with... Uh, a fun time on your hands. So let's go ahead and start with what's underneath the hood. So we're gonna cover a lot of the issues that you're gonna run into with these cars. Fortunately, this just has one of them. Everything from rust spots to, actually this has two things. The paint also has a tendency of burning off on these cars. Now, this being a Texas car, it has the, the paint burn through, but none of the rust, which is really awesome. It's really inexpensive to put new paint on a car. It gets very expensive when you have to start doing a lot of rust repair. So. That's another reason why I just could not pass up on this car. It is completely rust free, except for a little bit of surface rust in a spot that is gonna be very easy to repair, because all we have to do is just knock it down and just you know, repaint that spot. We'll cover that though, it's interior. You'll see it in a second. The major thing you're gonna to have to worry about with this is the engine. It did not inherit the traditional Toyota reliability. There's a reason for that. The 3.0 single turbo 7M GTE is a totally different animal than the 1JZ and 2JZ you'll find in the, uh, well, the 2JZ and the, the Mark IV and the 1JZ in the Japanese version of this car. Also, why would you want 2.5 liters? Bigger displacement. Come on. I swear it doesn't normally do that. Anyways, <laughs> this engine right here is really a great engine and if certain things didn't happen it would have been known for reliability guarantee it the biggest thing was in 1986 when these were originally going to be imported into the united states new york or the uh united states regulations made it so you could not import any vehicles with any asbestos not in the brakes so i don't know about brakes i shouldn't say that i don't know about that but not in the head gasket and the original head gaskets were uh asbestos embedded so they replaced it with a, shield, a steel shim gasket, which then they torqued it down to the same specification. And unfortunately, the book specification is way off, way off, and uh, under, under, under spec by quite a bit. So around 70,000 miles, these things all blow. They always have blown head gaskets. And I'll tell you what. If you get it and it hasn't had a blown head gasket, I don't care if it has 20,000 miles on it, you're doing the head gasket. It's just, trust me, not worth the aggravation. If someone already told you they replaced the head gasket, replace it again, because you don't know what they've done. Now, unfortunately, someone did leave the valve cover off of this because they started to redo the head gasket, and we'll cover that in a second. Um, so I can quickly glance down and see they reinstalled the original heads, head bolts. Don't do that on these cars. Definitely recommend the ARP studs. Not because hoity-toity ARP studs, but because, trust me, you need them for this engine. So, the reason why it's interesting that it has 
a blown head gasket is because I have receipts that in 2011, just supposedly right before this thing blew its head gasket again, in 2011, it had a bottom to top complete rebuild. And they spent quite a bit of money to do it. Unfortunately, again, it looks like they installed the original head, or head bolts. And uh, there's a couple reasons why we could have had a second head gasket blow. These engines are interesting because in the front of the engine, you'll find this piece right here. It's right behind the main pulley off the crankshaft. You have your idler and a few other things just kicking around down there. But if you get the deck, or, uh, if you get it decked, and this is not bolted onto it, you will, because your head gasket actually flows over this. And we'll find out if this is the reason. I'll have a couple of these left over, but if you're gonna have it decked, you need to have this attached to the vehicle or to the engine when you have it done, because otherwise you're gonna have a really bad time. A lot of the second times they've blown, that's why. <clears throat> now, HKS makes a, uh, a, a, a great, uh, multi-layer uh, stopper head gasket it's, it's a phenomenal option for it again ARP studs you're never gonna have a, a blown head gasket again unless you're like dumping tons of boost in this car but other than that this is a really good example has a little bit of cleaning up that needs to be done in here but again no rust and it should clean up just fine I, I could tell you a couple things that they did when they were working on this they pulled the engine and transmission at the same time which you can't do. These are actually, just like a lot of the old Mopars, they have to really take these from down below. If you're gonna take them out of the top, you have to separate the engine from the transmission, make sure the hood is off. Obviously they did not. They uh, did a little bit of damage to the liner and they damaged the radiator core support. Now I'll just get up underneath here and tap this out with a, a little hand doll and uh, a hammer, not a big deal. But if you're gonna be pulling this engine out, obviously do your standard stuff separate the engine from the transmission and right through the top <clears throat> or engine to transmission right through the bottom pro tip if you're doing the 1uz swap like we're doing in the black car highly recommend especially if you use like i made my own engine mount so that the engine will be as low and as far back as possible you can't actually put the transmission and the engine together with the engine in the car so down below up through the bottom it's a nightmare to go through the top it's just too big of an engine anyways so this, this is another thing you're gonna to wanna to look at is their CT26 um, turbochargers. If you're looking to do a quick mod, Garrett makes a front end on this thing that give you a little bit extra boost. Highly recommend that mod. But always check to see what the play is in this. And this has zero play, it spins really nicely. It keeps spinning after I, I've stopped. And one of the big things is a lot of people will not let this thing idle down after driving it. Let the, the oil run through the turbo to cool it down. It'll just shut it off and then the oil bakes off in here. It's a total mess. So this is actually a great um, condition turbo. It doesn't look like it was replaced. It looks like this is original. Other things that you'll find in here, I don't know why. I, I don't know if this was just because they were pulling it off, but this one is broken. I do have spares, so we'll be using a different one than the one that came with the car. But a lot of people like to put, I don't know, clear covers over this, or they'll just leave the cover off. Put the cover over it, guys. Like, why? Why do people do that? Also, G-Ready or Garrett, or, or no, G-Ready. G-Ready makes a, a great timing belt. I highly recommend for this instead of using the OEM one. Um, although we may use an o OEM one on this application because we're going to leave this car completely stock. And if it's good enough for 100,000, well, it's going to be taken off for the, this head gasket anyway. So if it's good enough for 70,000 miles, it's good enough for me. Other than that, if you're ever parting one of these out, one of the most expensive electronics is right here. And that's your igniter assembly. Not assembly, but your... Uh, ah, it's your uh, igniter control. It, it runs your coil pack that sits on the top. It is concerning that... For some time, this was left with no valve cover on the top of it. So in my opinion, we are going to be supporting the transmission and pulling the engine so that we can get a better look at this thing. I've rebuilt many of them in my day. So what's one more, right? So moving on from the main Achilles heel, we go to the rust.
Now this car is completely rust free. You're gonna to wanna to start looking through the fenders, along the rockers, quarter panel, it'll start to bubble over. And then the back side of this one's not so bad, but if we scoot underneath here, how well you can see, this thing will focus. I have the light on, but inside right here, you'll find that this will be an issue that will need to be addressed. This one is, of course, free of it. We spin around. You'll find a lot of rust along this section right here. And let's see if we can pop the, the trunk. You'll have water intrusion that will come in through here. And that's main is or the main issue on that is the uh weather stripping here so you're going to want to replace this weather stripping and replace the weather stripping behind the taillights now this one actually came with a couple extra taillights as well as the rear assembly here but you want to replace these in the gasket because the water will pool right here and then actually enter in underneath this area right here and it'll start to rot out your um spare tire well terrible terrible thing and it's a mess to deal with Again, on this side, you're going to have a couple of spots where you're going to have to worry about. Not only the quarter panel, which again, nice, clean, no rust. Now, on this side, you have a spot right here where the two seam welds are. And then same thing up in the front. These spots will rot out. I have a, uh, started to have an issue in the black car that will have to be resolved, but... Um, thinking about buying these check those spots because it's not very fun at all the rest of the underside is generally not an issue whatsoever but with the target tops um, mine just started leaking because I started doing the interior and of course that caused an issue I have one on order they're a little hard to get so it should be in this week check especially in the target tops check all along here for any moisture and any issues now let's go to the interior you're going to have a lot of cracked da or, uh, door cards located along the, sh the armrest as well as through here. Now, this one is nice and clean. Needs to be cleaned up a little bit better as far as dirt, but no cracks, nothing like that. <sighs> Center console, always cracked. Never seen one that wasn't. This one, unfortunately, is. You can kind of see oh, this right here is a little bit rough because this is leather this stuff is like old toyota i don't know crush velour type stuff i don't know what it's technically called but this is generally the only spot you're going to worry about all in all these hold up really well way better than the leather components these are always broken so this is incredible that it's not um this one is electric seat pretty good seat they are heavier than the day is long uh, around actually 80 pounds so heads up if you're trying to shave weight, I know I'm looking for a uh, either a passenger seat out of a Japanese car or a driver's seat that's manual. Because, again, 30 pounds, 80 pounds. One of the absolute worst and useless features of this vehicle, you can find located in your center console. After you've opened it up, you see you have a very shallow well to be able to store stuff. And if you put even a couple pieces of paper in there, you won't be able to use your cup holder. <laughs> I don't know who designed that, but it is completely unnecessary because it's useless. You have your mirror control, your lumbar support and all that fun stuff right here. You have your nice, oh, we have, yeah, another, this had like nine spare keys. Your Thames control right here. This is an automatic, which happens. Um, there's a reason why this is possibly one of the one of the rarer versions of the car. One, it's a great color. Two, it's a hard top with a factory moonroof. As you can see, no rust in it. And we, it does look like we have a little bit of uh, interior deal with right there. But other than that, the interior is in immaculate shape in that thing right there. Uh, and be prepared. Steering columns are always worn, real leather, people driving it hard, that type of stuff. 
and then the dashboards are normally really really cracked and as you can see you can't see through there we'll sit down this dashboard is in absolute immaculate condition normally you'll get a valley sitting right there and unfortunately uh, for most people that's uh, it's not easy to uh, deal with and unfortunately at some point someone switched out the stereo for a jvc which i'm not a stereo guy but i guess that's good don't know i would like to get an original one and put it in they had some really neat ones that ran cassette um and i don't know what that's all about what's in here nothing Let's see was this a smoker car yes this was a smoker car at one point but you can't smell it surprising probably because of hawaiian breeze well, I, I guess my light died. That's why you guys can't see what's going on. Yep, my light is not really good at all. But you can see the Hawaiian breeze. <laughs> That's why this smells so good. We do have a, a, a smart HVAC system. Just in case you're a smoker. Actually, a lot of times these are gone, so that's nice. I think I have one in inventory, but that's it. And this one has all the wonderful cruise control and stuff that you definitely don't need. And of course, it's a flip up and down headlight, but the battery's dead, so. Oh wait, no, it's, maybe the battery's not done. Throw the key in there. Let's see what it does. Oh. Do they work? Oh, so this is having the same issue as my black one where um, the contactor within here is having an issue. We'll have to resolve that. It's easy fix. A couple things I want to go over. I've seen people say that these things weigh around 4,000 pounds. No, that's about 500 pounds off. They weigh around 3,500. And I know that they're about 100 pounds heavier than their newer Mark IV version. But honestly, I'll tell you what, that doesn't make too much of a difference. If you want to lose weight out of these things, you can easily drop it below 3,000 pounds. That being said, you could do a lot to these. There's a, it's a great platform to throw a V8 in. It's a great platform to throw a 2JZ in. Maybe Weston, Weston Chaplin will throw a Cummins in one of them. Who knows? But either way, it's a great platform to do pretty much anything you want. Now, this car right here is an excellent example of an all-original car with some minor defects. The crazy part about it is where this would end up on the price range. Now, mind you, we will go ahead and replace the head gasket, and I don't count that towards anything because, honestly, I've done enough of them that it's not a big deal, and if you're buying one, you really should just do it yourself. Um, but we'll replace the head gasket. I'm not, I was originally intending on selling this a few years ago, but especially after getting my hands on this car and seeing how close to being like right off the showroom this thing is, it's only a few uh, shades away from being an absolute immaculate condition, especially with the rust. It's a great starter for that. A car like this that has not been manipulated and butchered expect to get around 15,000 for it. I have seen them go all the way up to 24,000, but um, this being underneath 100,000 miles at just over 80,000, it's not far out of the realm to think that this car can go for around 20, $22,000. Crazy, especially if you throw some paint on it. But I've even seen these with the sunroof because the sunroof is not the most desirable if you're looking to turn around and make a track car. You want a hard top. But once you get into the 89s newer, hard tops become very hard to come by. Almost exclusively target tops, which gets a little bit extra flex. Can You can get around that with leaving the target top in or getting a cross member that goes in its place. But hard tops, they're hen's teeth. So expect one in this paint condition with a fully running engine and transmission, automatic, not manual, to run you around 17,000. Um, if it was full of rust, if you were to try finding one of these things full of rust, you're looking at around $7,000. Parts cars go for around three to $4,000. And 
cars with very few parts and quite honestly are only worth the front and rear subframes, you're going to probably spend around $1,500 for them. That said, the price I paid on this car was a grand total, excluding going to pick it up and gas and all that stuff, $3,000. $3,000 changed hands so that I could own this car. And I got to say, this was a steal. Sure, we have the head gasket to deal with. I have spare heads and all the other components. I should have enough to be able to put this together, short of a gasket kit in stock, and have no, i probably do it in a weekend. Uh, it depends on if someone did machine work on it and they didn't do it right, in which case then, that's the luck of the draw. It depends on when you get your engine into uh, a machine shop. Um, fortunately, my machine shop guys could probably do uh, the work on a, an engine in about two weeks before we get it back to be able to reassemble, so we'll see. But if you're looking to get an awesome car, especially if this, like my black car, didn't have the original engine, and it's only original once, we had a mini tornado, <laughs> and it's only original once, so I decided, heck it, let's go, throw a 1UZ in there, get 750 horsepower out of it, and uh, go do Power Tour and then No Name National. I thought that was, it's going to be a great, right now, I don't have a manual bender, so it's down at a shop getting the exhaust put together. That's why you don't see it here. But we should hopefully have that back today because we got to get the interior in. And I'm hoping to have that together to run that uh, our first test and tune without the supercharger to see what it compares against something like this. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm going to own three of these cars because I keep saying that the 1UZ should have been in the Mark III Supra and would have made it one of the greatest cars ever made. It would have been right there with, say... The, uh, I would say the GS Stage 1, I prefer that over the, the GTX, or even the old Roadrunners. Or, honestly, like I have a list of five cars that I really would love to own. Most of them I'll never be able to afford. A Hemi Cuda or Challenger from 1970, that would be like cherry on top. Um, a perfectly original, sorted out 1970 Buick Sky Skylark GS Stage 1 with that beautiful, beautiful 455 monster hemi killer that that's that's right there as one of my apps now i have a, a a tribute to the one that i had that is rotted out and too far gone um and then these guys right here and then a few other miscellaneous things um like i would love i would love to have a 71 roadrunner unfortunately they're incredibly expensive and very rare uh, at least up here so i do have a 72 satellite it's probably the closest i'll ever get but these cars, when I was growing up, they were cheap. I was able to buy these for 300 bucks and take them to Lebanon Valley Speedway. I had a blue one that was non-turbo. I had that thing gutted and worked as best as I could. And I was able to, the best I could ever go down a track on that was uh, 1277. Now I did build that as an autocross car, not a drag car. So keep that in mind. But uh, there was no unnecessary weight in that car at all. Um, but hey, we'll see what this, this black car with the 1UZ does. And I think this is the definition of the perfect Supra, perfect Japanese import that is being built with the inspiration of what the guys would have done in the late 60s, early 70s. Just with fuel injection. And the best way to see what people would do with fuel injection as far as back in the 70s, look at the guys down in Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand. Um, they have the spirit that us car guys have and their 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 car culture down there is wicked cool they're nuts in the best way possible so we'll get back on the black car as soon as it's back from getting the exhaust put together i i did buy the uh it looks factory it's just three inch exhaust instead of two and a half but um i didn't want to go with the canister one I, i'm not a big fan of that style i prefer not looking like that. I don't like doing exterior bottom mods. I think these things look great the way they are. So, on that, I showed you the spots that rust the most with the uh, the target tops. Pull the the top of the target top off. And look at the front brim for any rust. Learn from my mistake on the latest uh, project, the black one there. Uh, don't take the target top off until you have a brand new weather strip kit for it because otherwise it'll leak like a sieve. Didn't have a problem with the target top leaking until I did that. So 
It should have that this week. It's windy again. So on that, guys, I gotta say, don't knock it because it's a Japanese import. Trust me, it's an awesome car. And you guys that do like Japanese imports, don't knock it because it's not a Mark IV. I'll tell you what, I do like the way that they look. Not my favorite. To me, they kind of have a little bit of a... Uh, it's too bubbly. It's cool looking. It's definitely 90s. This is definitely 80s. Painfully 80s. And I love it. I love cars that came out of the early 70s and the 80s. So, guys, if you are a Mark IV guy and you, you can't, or if you love the Mark IV and you can't afford one, maybe reconsider. Take a look at these Mark III's. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Plenty of options, a lot of things that people have done to them. If you want to follow the steps and put a 2JZ in it, more than happy to. It'll definitely fit. A few modifications on certain things, but um, again, I will put my money where my mouth is, and we'll buy a third one, and we'll put a 2JZ in it, and I will, I will eat my words if I'm wrong, but I'll, I promise you that that supercharged 1UZ is going to be a far better car all day, every day. So until then, guys, remember, keep your shiny side up. If you want to follow the builds, whether it's the 70 Buick Skylark, the 72 Satellite, this, uh, well, we'll be doing the restoration on this thing, at least to get it drive. It's a great, great driver right now. It's a phenomenal driver. Or the, the Black Super we're taking on Power Tour and No Name National. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you want to help support the channel, I would really appreciate you checking out our new t-shirts over at the Blacktop Yacht Club. Maybe you pick up the, the satellite shirt. Maybe you'll pick up the, uh, the Buick t-shirt. We'll work on getting a, a super t-shirt out when we can. And uh, check out some of the other shirts there. Jonathan has a lot of great merch there. His, the, the shirts are crazy good quality. Far better than my previous uh, uh, vendor that I was going through that most people do. I don't want to say who they are. But uh, I'm sure you've encountered the fact that when you put that other company's clothes through the wash, they just peel off. So not a, you know... Of course, I have a vetted, vent, vested interest in selling t-shirts through him because I get paid, so there's, you know, heads up. But I really like it. That's why I chose him for my merchandise. So head over there, pick up a really cool sweater. I'll tell you what, they're super, they are super comfortable, and uh, we have t-shirts available, stickers. Oh, I don't have one on this one. I have one on the black car. I don't have, I have one over on the... I'll show you the sticker. Again, a big shout-out to Jonathan for doing a phenomenal design for our logo. And uh, guys, if you like old muscle cars, or maybe even if you like Japanese imports, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Again, keep your shiny side up, and until next time, God bless.